just looking at scripture itself, the, just looking at the canon of scripture, the 66 books, you know, we, how many uh, angels fell with Lucifer, right? One third, we know that. 33.33%, remember that number. 33.33. But how much do we really know about that one third of the fallen angels? You know, we, we know Lucifer is their leader, but we don't really know a whole lot more than that. You may maybe get some vague references like the Prince of Persia that, you know, Michael and, you know, all that. Uh, but we don't get a whole lot of details about uh, the fallen angels in the 66 books. Uh, of course, Lucifer being their leader, uh, the woman said to the serpent, Lucifer being the serpent, uh, the serpent deceived me and I ate. So the Lord said to the serpent, because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and all wild animals. You will crawl in your belly and you will eat dust all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring. Whose offspring? The devil's offspring, the serpent's offspring. Interesting. And hers, first prophecy in the Bible. And he will crush your head, and you will strike his heel. How many of you know getting your head crushed would be kind of bad? <laughs> so what do you think the devil did? If the devil's for the first prophecy given is that her seed is going to crush your head, what do you think he's going to do to her seed? He's going to try to mess with the seed, isn't he? So he doesn't get his head crushed, right? So the first thing he does is he gets two brothers to get into a fight and one to kill the other one. They only have two children. Cain and Abel, and Cain killed his brother. Now, obviously, if you're looking at that text, it seems that Cain was predisposed to listening to the voice of the enemy, and Abel was predisposed to listening to the voice of God and being obedient. And so the devil got the one that he could get to listen to him to kill the good one, right? So how many of you know that if you lose a child, especially to a traumatic event such as that, that if you have another child, you're going to become extremely protective over your next child, probably even overly protective. So I don't believe the devil was really able to get to Seth uh, too well, not like he did to Cain anyway. And so he turned the page to chapter 6 of Genesis, and you got plan B, <laughs> I think, where the, the uh, sons of God, which is Benai Elohim, if I'm pronouncing that right in Hebrew, uh, I really get frustrated by seminaries and pastors and people who teach the Sethite theory that the sons of God are the sons of Seth and the daughters of men are the daughters of Cain. That's ridiculous. The same Hebrew phrase is used in the book of Job referencing the angels and how Lucifer appears before God and, you know, and all that. So they can accept that that phrase, the Benat Elohim, is angels in Job, and yet they deny it in Genesis. That's just, uh, I don't understand that, but... Anyway, the text says what it says. It's the angels come down, and they mated with the daughters of men, and they created a creature called the Nephilim, angel-human hybrids. Google Earth is a, is a fun program to play around with, so I decided to look and check out Mount Hermon to see where it is. And so this is where the 200 fallen angels called Watchers landed on planet Earth. They landed right about here. Mount Hermon is, a, is actually a... Uh, a mountain range. It's a, it's a range of mountains, and this is pretty much the uh, the center of the mountain range that is Mount Hermon. Now keep your eyes kind of in that area right there. Now maybe this is just my overactive imagination as a filmmaker, <laughs> but I was looking at that and I was like, wow, it, it kind of, just the outline of the topography there, take it for whatever it is, I was just like, that's pretty interesting. Yeah, yeah kind of cool. Uh, so that's where the ancient texts say that the fallen angels landed. Now, uh, this is Mount Hermon today, and have any of you heard of a guy by the name of David Flynn? Yeah. David Flynn uh, has done some amazing work, and you can confirm this for yourself on Google Earth. He determined that the location, the center of the Mount Hermon mountain range is 33.33 degrees north by 33.33 degrees east from the Paris Prime Meridian, which was the true Prime Meridian until they changed it for political reasons. Now, Google Earth, you'll see, has 35.54, but if you subtract the difference between Greenwich and Paris, you, you end up with 33.33. Uh, but he took it a step farther. He measured the, the distance between the, that location and went west and found that it was 2,012 nautical miles. 2,012, there's that magic number, right? 2,012 nautical miles from that location to the Paris Prime Meridian and 2,012 nautical miles from that location to the equator. Again, is that a coincidence? Hmm, I don't think so. I think it's all adding up to something. Yeshua said, As it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be at the coming of the Son of Man. 
Yesterday, I talked about the name Yeshua. I do believe there is power in the name of Jesus. I accepted Christ under the name of Jesus, and I've led many people to Christ in the name of Jesus in the foreign mission field, both, both foreign and domestic. I've uh, been in ministry, uh, in and out of ministry most of my life. But I believe there's an enormous amount of power in the name of Yeshua as well, which is his given name. That's his Hebrew name. And my wife and I have been taking Hebrew classes, and uh, it's really interesting. There's a Hebrew idiom that says every letter has seven meanings. Every Hebrew letter has seven meanings. Therefore, every word has 70. And so they say that uh, the words have meaning, not only the meaning of the word itself, but the combined meaning of the letters that comprise the word. So it's a very complicated, very interesting in, in, uh, language. But what I love about breaking down the letters of Yeshua, Yod, Shin, Vav, Ein, is right to left, reading right to left as the Hebrews do. The name Yeshua translates to the hand that destroys the establishment of the eye. Okay? That's what Yeshua's name means. The hand that destroys the establishment of the eye. If you saw my talk yesterday, you know what the eye is in reference to, right? Antichrist, Nimrod, Osiris, the back of your dollar bill. 33.33. What did the devil what, what did Jesus say? He came to destroy the works of the devil. I think it's so cool because he did it in every way, even his name and, and, and the he was what, 33, right? He died at 33 after a three-year ministry and was dead for three days. <laughs> 3333. Here's what's really cool. There's a passage of scripture where Jesus takes his disciples to Caesarea Philippi and he asks the question, Who do you say that I am? I never understood that scripture because, you know, Peter says, You're the Christ, the Son of the living God, and Jesus gets real excited about it, doesn't he? If you read that passage. And I never said, Why is he getting so excited about that when from the day he was born, people told him he was the Son of God, and the angels singing it, you know, uh, when he, he uh, he's. Uh, he picks Nathaniel to be a, a disciple. Nathaniel declares that he's the son of God, and he says, why? Because I saw you under the fig tree? Well, you're going to see greater things than that. Every time the demon-possessed people saw him, they, they cried out and said, you are the Christ. He said, be quiet. So his whole life, people told him he was the son of God. So why, at the end of his ministry, when Peter says it, why does he get so excited? I could never understand that till I stood in the location where that conversation took place in 2005. This is where Yeshua stood when he asked the question, who do men say that I am? He stood at the base of Mount Hermon, right there, in Caesarea Philippi, where there was an altar to the Greek god Pan, who was the god of shepherds. So I think it's awfully poetic that the good shepherds stood in front of the Greek god of shepherds and asked the question. Then, actually, if you're standing there looking at the altar pan, which was very much kind of like Petra, you know, like a city in the, in the rock. It wasn't quite that big, but it was embedded in the rock. Just off to the right is a foothill, and at the top of the foothill is a place called the Fortress of Nimrod, who was the first Antichrist who tried to create a one-world system without God, in fact, tried to kill God. So as he's looking at pan in front of him, off to the right, is the fortress of Nimrod. Off to the left is a location that even still to this day, but at the time was still was known as the Gates of Hades, a physical location. So when he says the Gates of Hades will not prevail, he was standing right in front of the Gates of Hades, which I've maintained is not just a place. Hades is the brother of Zeus. It's, a, it's an entity as well. And then something really interesting happens. It says six days later that Yeshua took Peter, James, and John to the top of a high mountain. Well, Mount Hermon is by far the, t the tallest mountain in the region, and they're in the area anyway. So many scholars believe, as I do, that he took them to the top of Mount Hermon for the Mountain of Transfiguration, where today there is a UN radar outpost. Huh. I understand the strategic location with Syria and Lebanon and all that, but it's kind of interesting that there is right across from a cross where people believe is the spot of the Mountain of Transfiguration took place, that the UN of today, just like Yeshua of his day, could look down from that spot to the very location where the watchers landed. Very strategic location to bring them right to the spot where, where the, the plan was hatched that tried to prevent him from existing in the first place. Genesis chapter 6, right? The devil wants to destroy the seed of Eve so that the seed of Eve can't crush his head. Well, the seed of Eve was standing right there looking down and basically I believe he was looking off and saying, okay, I got your number. Let's play. 
The best way I can explain this as an, as an allegory is the movie Rocky, which I've come to realize is not a movie about boxing. It's, an, it's actually a pretty extraordinary series, and there's a couple of them that are kind of goofy and all that, but uh, I don't know where St- Sylvester Stallone stands in his faith. He claims to be a Christian. He, he's, you know, he's made some questionable movies and stuff, but, but as a writer myself and, and filmmaker, I, there's something in him that he understands. Let's just put it that way. Everything that's in a movie is, an inten- is very intentional. Nothing ends up on screen except that it has been well thought out in advance, planned out, and orchestrated. Okay, so the very first scene that you see in Rocky, when you fade from black, fade up from black, is a picture of Jesus. It's the first thing you see when, when the movie fades up from black, is a picture of Jesus. You, the camera pulls back a little bit farther, and there's Rocky fighting Spider Rico and two nobodies in the basement of a church. Notice what it says behind him, resurrection. Okay, so he's a nobody, fighting a nobody. Then he gets this unbelievable chance of a lifetime to go up against the heavyweight champion of the world, right? What's his name? Apollo Creed. Apollo, son of Zeus, son of perdition, (laughs) antichrist. Creed is the belief system of a people group. So Rocky, the rock, is going up against Apollo Creed, the heavyweight champion of the world. What does he do before the big fight? He goes and surveys the ring. So he walks into the ring that night before the big fight. There's a big giant banner of Apollo Creed. He goes home, and he has sort of his Garden of Gethsemane moment of doubt. Sits with Adrian, not sure if he can go through with this whole plan. And then this, this quiet resolve comes over him, and he gets this, this new strength, and he just says, you know what, I don't care if I beat him, I just want to go 15 rounds. No one has ever gone the distance with Creed. That's all he cared. He wanted to go to the distance with Creed's. So, next day, gets into the fight of his life, takes the beating of his life from the heavyweight champion of the world, round after round, just being pummeled. And, and Apollo is given everything he has, unleashing on Rocky. But after 15 rounds, Rocky was still standing. The last scene in the movie is everybody's flipping out, right? You, you remember, you, you were just as excited as everybody in the movie, right? woo you made it, yell! Everybody's excited, and the, and the commentator's like, Rocky, what was going through your mind? Rocky, what were you thinking? And as he's saying that, Adrian, his bride-to-be, is coming into the, into the ring area, and Polly lets her in. And the last line in the movie is Adrian saying, I love you, and Rocky saying, I love you. Fade the black. I'm like, I've seen that story somewhere before pretty amazing and then if you take it to Rocky 2 Rocky the rock the second coming first he marries Adrian he gets married and then he goes back into the ring and he beats Apollo hmm I'm like I don't know if, <laughs> if Sylvester Stallone really gets it but man that's an amazing analogy for what I think is going on on Mount Hermon in Caesarea Philippi because Jesus right before he's about to go 15 rounds with the devil so to speak went and surveyed the ring. He went, and from that location, he could look down to the Antichrist, to the fortress of Nimrod. He could look over to the location where the fallen angels landed to try to prevent him from existing in the first place. He could look down to the gates of Hades and the altar of Pan. He's like, okay, Nimrod, I got your number. Okay, watchers, you wait. You watch. <laughs> you're, you're in for something. Because it says from that point on that from that moment on, Jesus went from that location there for the Mount of the Transfiguration, preaching about his death, burial, and resurrection. And he headed directly to Jerusalem, where he went 15 rounds with the devil and was still standing when it was over. And oh, by the way, it says that he went down first, right, after he died. And m- many of your translations probably say preached to those in prison. I think that's kind of a poor translation. The word Caruso, it's, it's heralded in victory. He went down to Tartarus and said, Aha, you lose, I win, I'm taking the keys, I'll be back, and it's not going to be good for you. On his way up, he liberated the saints in Abraham's bosom. Pretty amazing thing that really makes the statement make a whole lot more sense now why Yeshua took them to Caesarea Philippi, of all places, to ask that pretty profound question. And Peter's answer, which is so amazing, because I can see Peter sitting there going, you know, the rabbi knows who we think he is. This must be a rhetorical question. 
You know, his buddies are going, you know, some say Jeremiah, some say Elijah, Jeremiah, whatever. And I see Peter just kind of going, what is he really asking? And as a filmmaker, I, this is the way I see the scene, is that, that Yeshua has his back to, to pan, and, and Peter's looking at, at Yeshua, and it's called a rack focus. Yeshua goes out of focus, and pan comes in focus. Pan goes out of focus, and Yeshua comes in focus, and he goes, oh, I get it. You are the Christ, the son of the living God. Yeah, that's right, Peter. Blessed are you. Because flesh and blood did not reveal this, but my father just told you what we're doing here. My destination is Jerusalem. He took an awfully big detour to go all the way up to southern Lebanon to have this little conversation. Peter understood what was going on there. And he says that upon this rock I'll build my church and the gates of what or who? Hades will not prevail. And then he goes on to talk about some really interesting things about binding and loosing. I think we're going to have to understand this whole binding and loosing thing. I really do. And that's why we have created a TV series called Seed that we're working desperately to get on the air. Our stated mission statement for Seed is to plant seeds that will enable people to understand the times that we're living in and to walk in the power of the kingdom that comes only through a relationship with Jesus Christ. I put together a little three-minute trailer to show you. Um, we haven't had the ability or the money to do it with live action. The actual TV series will be shot with live action, but I created a concept animation just to illustrate some of the, uh, what it's about. So uh, for the next three minutes, I will show you a trailer for the forthcoming TV series, Seed. My name is Zach Randall. Everyone thinks I'm dead. But I'm not. In December of 2002, my unit was sent to Iraq looking for weapons of mass destruction. On the night of Christmas Eve, we found one. I don't know what happened to me that night, but my quest for answers begins here. Thank you.